Let's pray. God, you have called us to gather here. But not only have you called us, you have sent us to be your people in the world. In this hour, we pray that you will have already begun to speak to us in the prayers that we've offered, in the praise that we've sung, in the scripture that we've read. And now, God, I ask that you will allow your servant to stand in the shadow of the cross. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts are pleasing and acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this, this weekend, uh, every year, presents a bit of a challenge for folk like me. We don't want to not acknowledge the obvious, but we also want to tread lightly and not worship things we ought not. But we all know that tomorrow in this land that we call the United States of America, we celebrate, as we should, as we absolutely should, we celebrate the official day marking the formation of a nation. And that remembrance of our independence is tied to a war, the revolutionary war to be exact and that war for the people who called the 13 colonies established in the America's home that war broke the ties that that bound and obligated them to the crown of England and it was the first of many wars fought by soldiers of this country, wars that were fought abroad, wars that were fought on our own shores. And those wars, regardless of where they were fought, at least in part, at least in part, were, to, were fought to establish and to preserve the continued existence of a nation. And while the Revolutionary War was a conflict between nations, and then it, it was a conflict that very likely uh, saw cousins fighting against cousins, in less than a hundred years later, we would find ourselves engaged in a war pitting brother against brother. And those fighting each other in the Civil War shared heritage and they shared history and very often they shared genealogy. But you know all this already, right? You, you, are, you are intelligent folk. You did not come here for me to give you a history lesson. I say all of this I say all this more out of reflection and contemplation as I consider where we currently find ourselves in, in, embroiled in the world's turmoil. I say this as I contemplate and reflect upon um, uh, where we find ourselves in a divided nation. I say this as I reflect about where we find ourselves in a fractured denomination. And I say this while at the same time 
considering who we are called to be as people of faith, as, as followers of Jesus, as disciples sent out to be peacemakers and kingdom proclaimers and God bearers to the world. And I can't help, I can't help but think, isn't it interesting, isn't it so very interesting how close those we call enemy can be to us. War is not an instrument of peace. War is not an instrument of harmony or wellness or wholeness or completeness. It never has been. War is full escalation of division and conflict. War is about power and control. And war fully rejects peace as an outcome. It demands that one side surrender to the will and the demands of the other. And this, and this is true in armed conflict between nations and governments. It is true when the wars are between religions and ideologies. It is true in wars of words and wars of culture and denominational wars in the church. And while some certainly have joined war for the noble causes, the very noble causes of justice and freedom. Some have even joined wars to bring about the kind of peace that exists in the absence of conflict, of open conflict. Very often, very often those who wage war do not seek a healthy kind of peace or a healthy kind of wholeness and wellness and completeness for everyone, especially those we might call enemy. But that's the goal, right? That real peace and equity, that, that's, that, that's the goal. And in this nation, there's a document. The document is called the Declaration of Independence. And that document presents a beautiful vision of self-evident truths that all are created equal. Even if some were treated less than equally when that document was first adopted and its ideals put in to practice. I mean, we know women were not treated equally. Indigenous peoples were not treated equally. Enslaved people and non-landowners were not treated equally. They did not benefit equally from the declaration as it was written originally. But the good news, the good news of this particular story is that people over the years have claimed the beauty and the truth of the words that were written in that document. The principles put into writing by the author of the declaration had more promise, held more promise and power than the people who actually penned those words. And for the most part, people have understood that we, that we all collectively are responsible for each other and responsible to each other in order to prevail over that which would tear us apart. We say, we say very much the same thing as people of faith in our communities of faith. 
in churches, and particularly in the United Methodist Church, we proclaim that, that God's image is in all and on all. We proclaim that God's grace is extended to all. We proclaim that, that in the United Methodist Church, at our baptism, we, we collectively renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, and we reject all evil powers. We resist evil we say at our baptism, we will reject, we will, we will reject, resist injustice and oppression in every form. We say we will accept God's grace and we promise to serve Jesus as Lord and to be his representatives in the world and we promise to remain faithful. That's in our baptismal covenant. If you want to read these words, it's found on page 34 in your hymn book, just if you were wondering. And we did not just make this stuff up. We come to this understanding through the traditions of the church that have been handed down from those who have gone on before. And we trace those traditions all the way back to the Lord Jesus himself. And we, and, and we base that also on the words that we find in Scripture. And we see in our Scripture reading today, Jesus giving his disciples, those persons that he sent out to you, he gave them power. He, he gave them permission to use uh, his power and his authority, including are indicating that, that they would prevail over the evil forces of the world, that they, that they would go out and that they would be peace seekers and peace speakers and peacemakers, that they would go out to the world to, to heal and to be agents of restoration and reconciliation and wholeness and peace. A peace that Jesus might say, and might use the word shalom. And that Jesus would send folk out to do that should not surprise us. That's what Jesus was all about. That's kingdom work. But we've heard that in church for as long as we've been coming to church, as long as we've been worshiping at church. You know what I find interesting about this story? I love this story. Here's what I find interesting. I find interesting that his instructions, that Jesus' instructions on how they are to go out and how they are to approach those that they encounter. They're to say, may peace be on this house. You know what that is? That's a blessing. That is a blessing. I find it so very interesting that the envisioned outcome of God's kingdom coming near to us begins not, not with an army of angels wielding fiery swords. The, 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 in, the envisioned outcome of God's kingdom coming near to us begins not with healing miracles or, or the casting out of, of demons. It doesn't even begin with a, with a now is the time for repentance. The envisioned, the envisioned outcome of God's kingdom coming near to us begins with a blessing, with peace resting on the places we live and with the people that we love. How cool is that? 
And, and if, we, if we will allow ourselves to, to let this thing play out, if we will, if we will extend this out, then we can, we can begin adding peace-filled homes together. And pretty soon there will be a peace-filled neighborhood. And then peace-filled communities. And it can continue until the world is filled with God's peace. And, 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 and I mean, it's, it's very reminiscent of the peaceable kingdom vision that we, that we read in the Old Testament prophet's book of Isaiah. And, and as beautiful a vision as that is, what's even more interesting, what's even more compelling is that Jesus sent out folks, sent out regular folks, sent out non-preacher kinds of folks, sent out people like you, People with everyday kinds of jobs and everyday kinds of responsibilities. Those are the people that Jesus sent out to proclaim the peace of the kingdom of God to all people. And he sent them out in teams, not as individuals. He sent them out as teams. They were dependent upon each other. And, and they were dependent upon those to whom they were sent. Everybody depending upon everybody else. Interdependence. Mutual dependence is so important for God's peace. Interdependence. Mutual dependence is a vital part of God's kingdom. Interdependence, mutual dependence is critical, is critical on this weekend when we want to celebrate independence. And it occurs to me, it occurs to me that peacemaking is fundamentally a connectional activity. Peacemaking connects us to God. Peacemaking requires that people interact with each other, that they communicate with each other, that they listen to each other, that they share with each other, that they depend upon each other, just like Jesus demonstrated in his earthly ministry. And the manner in which we deal with others, especially in times of conflict, reveals our heart. It reveals our identity as children of God. Bringing peace into conflict and going with peace out of conflict is to be in the very presence of God. It is to, it is to bear the very presence of God to others. It is, it is to bring the peace of God to others. We we become the peace of God to others. And perhaps, and here's the thing, and perhaps if, if we will allow ourselves some vulnerability, if we will allow ourselves eyes to see and, and ears to hear, if we will allow ourselves to have a, a soft heart and, 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 and even just a little bit of humility, we might just discover that others, that others can be God's peace for us. Sometimes, sometimes I fear that we as, as people of faith too often speak of 
being at peace with God as having heard Jesus whispering in our ear, my peace I give you, and then we leave it there. Look, I pray that we all hear that whispering voice of Jesus giving us peace. I pray that every one of us experience that being at peace with God. But if that is as far as our relationship with Jesus goes, then we're missing something. You see, we not only need to hear that, we need to we need to experience that, but, but we also, we also as disciples, as those persons who are to go out and to do the things that Jesus says do and to, and to do the things that Jesus ha- has, has done, we, when we go out, we are supposed to embody that peace. We are supposed to speak that peace. We are supposed to give that peace to others. We, we are to be peacemakers. And that is a great gift to be peacemakers. Matter of fact, I I can't think of anything more important right now in our history than to share that gift I can't think of anything more important right now where we find ourselves in history than for us to be kingdom proclaiming, Jesus imitating, spirit filled, loving, praying, humble peacemakers. Everything that we have read in Luke's gospel the last few weeks points to this. Jesus, look, Jesus never ever puts limits on what it means to love your neighbor. Neither should we. That is not the vision of peace that Jesus models for his disciples. Jesus' vision is reconciling. Jesus' vision is restoring. Jesus' vision is renewing of relationships, both within the community of faith and with the community beyond. And the way that we demonstrate that, the way that that we show that, the way that we make that real is through mutual care and hospitality. The world that, that Luke envisions does not have Jews and Gentiles sitting at separate tables eating their own kinds of food. The world that Luke envisions has all people enjoying the kind of connection that occurs at the Last Supper when the disciples drink from a common cup, when they they eat from a common loaf. They, they They even included the one who betrayed Jesus, the one whose hand was on the table dipping in the common dish. Even Judas was included at the table. We need, we need to break bread together. I mean, we all got to eat, right? Some of us have eaten too much at times, but we all have to eat The sharing of a meal breaks down barriers to communication. The sharing of a meal leads to communication and and understanding. There is something so very special that happens when one dish is passed from one hand to another. It is a simple way of reaching out to someone else. And if we start that, the practice of reaching out to, that can become a habit, a good habit. 
the giving and the sharing and the receiving can embed itself in our behavior, in our hearts, and it can shift attitudes. It can change how we are. It can, it can make our defenses drop low. Is it any wonder, is it any wonder that Jesus sent his disciples out with the instructions like that when they enter somebody's house? He sends them with the instruction to extend hospitality and blessing in the form of peace. And he did that. He told them to do that before they do anything else. Before they do anything else, that is what they're supposed to do. God's peace be upon this house that encourages care and concern and compassion. God's peace be on this house that involves serving and being vulnerable. God's peace be on this house can turn strangers, even enemies, into community because God's peace is the greater gift. And it is for all of us, all followers, to be peace speakers and peace seekers and peace makers. We're called to be disciples, right? Discipleship comes by invitation, not by force. The kingdom of God is realized not by force, not by conquest, not by coercion, but by choice and the presence of God's peace and wholeness and completeness. The most gospel-centered way of living is to build and to nurture communities of peace. Peace received overcomes oppressing powers that keep people down. Peace welcomed changes systems and hold, that, that hold communities bound. Peace embraced and invited to take bread provides a victory that no war can ever win. May peace be our goal, our guide, and our gift. May peace be in our faith communities. May peace be in our political dialogue. May peace be in our homes. May peace be our invitation and our encouragement and our companion in life's journey. May peace be. May peace be. In the name of the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit.